Well, I'm, I'm Paul Brack, and uh, Bridget will be joining me in a minute. I think she stepped over for a little break. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a big project that we did uh, for this year. Um, here's Bridget now, and she'll get us started on it. Okay, ready to go? Yeah, we So my name is Bridget Wilson, and um, Paul and I are colleagues at Duke University um, in web services. And he may have given an introduction while I was gone. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, we're with the web services group with um, uh, Duke University School of Law, and um, we're here to talk about our case note composi um, competition site, which was a LAMP solution. So we'll go through this um, presentation, and we'll take questions at the end. Well, the first thing is, is basically defining um, what exactly is a case note. And for some, um, it was new to me, is coming into the law school. So a case note is basically a scholarly report of a recent or significant decision um, having to do with some type of, from Supreme Court to any type of court decision. Um, this journal competition, it is for our 1Ls after they have completed their first year of studies. Um, and then what happens is that each applicant applies to be an a a editor on one or more of the journals and the application is submitted um, online. And how did we get to where we are now? We're at Duke Law, we do have nine journals. And um, the way that the competition is set up is that exi existing editors read the case notes that are submitted by the 1Ls and they actually grade it. Now in the past, this process was actually done the old fashioned way, it was done by hand. Um, and that, can, as you can imagine, could lead to um, certain problems because we're dealing with um, human error. So we basically had to automate this process. And in order to do that, we benchmarked or talked to some other law schools that already were using an online process, which was NYU and Georgetown. And they were a tremendous help in giving us the, the inner, not giving us, but you know, giving us kind of a benchmark for the, um, the interface, I would say. And this leads to what happened as a uh, as benchmarking uh, from those two universities, what happened. So here's the solution. We created an online package that gathered and distributed an application package. And we used a LAMP technology, which was a Linux server with an Apache web server installed. We used a MySQL database um, on another Linux server, and we used PHP and HTML in order to create um, this particular uh, online process. And the team that worked on this were two outgoing law students. We used two second year editors. We used staff members that were involved in the past when we were doing it the uh, traditional hard, um, hard way. And then of course web services, and which included Paul, who is our programmer guru. Um, and he led a lot of this, especially when it comes to the technology part. And he'll go over you know, what the goals were. Okay. Well, uh, as Bridget said, it was completely totally manual. The students, if they wanted to apply to all nine journals, they would make nine copies of their case note and hand them out in the little drawers. And then um, existing editors were the graders, and they would pick them up and they'd shuffle them out. So if there was supposed to be four people grading uh, each applicant for a particular journal, they'd make sure they had four, and then they'd shuffle them. and. Uh, I'm not sure how they work preferences. We've, I've been here less than a year, but um, basically in some cases we didn't know what the students' preferences were. And in the nature of these journals, you're only allowed on one. So if it's an excellent student, they should get their, the journal that they really want. And on top of that, and more complicated than uh, our case with NYU and Georgetown, which we met with, there was only one. You could only be on one journal and that was it. And we have six journals where that's the case. We have three journals where you could be on an exclusive journal and one of these non-exclusive journals. Um, and or maybe they just say, oh, I really wanted that journal anyways. So the whole process and notification, turn down, turn in your application, it really had to take a 180 degree turn. So. Uh, one of the things we obviously needed to do is still sort of follow that applying for a given journal. 
I want to apply for Alaska Law Review. Um, and Alaska Law Review takes or doesn't take a personal statement. They're going to grade the case now in this manner, and uh, they may or may not take into account uh, a student's GPA. So those are all different rules that we have to plug into, but we still want the students to apply once and through one online system and be able to plug in all that information. So uh, we, we needed to meet with those individuals involved with that because um, I know very little about this <laughs> and uh, I don't come from a background in about law at all. I didn't know what a case net was. So it's really just sort of learning a little bit about that. So we knew as a goal initially, we knew we needed to uh, find the, out what these individual journal rules were, try and incorporate into the system, and follow their scoring criteria. Um, this whole process, I guess, between everyone printing everything, and we physically mail things to the editors who are now on summer break, and mailing out that much stuff, it, it really just did cost money. And along the lines of saving money as well, we programmed it ourselves with resources we had on hand, um, this, this LAMP technology, the Linux, it's everything involved with it is free, um, open source materials, and as well, there's a lot of examples. So um, uh, quite a few of us know PHP programming, well, at least two of us know PHP programming over at the law school, and uh, we already had uh, this set up on a, a few servers, and we can move forward with it. Um, this is an anonymous competition. Uh, that is, the editors that are grading go by a student number or go by an alias. And uh, we really just don't want you know, people to be grading based on, oh, it's a friend, we're just gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. So again, uh, we wanted the anonymous submissions online, track it internally in the database via keys, and um, uh, move forward from there. The, uh, uh, we have a browser base that was what we decided. Clearly everyone, whether they're running a Linux desktop or a Macintosh, uh, various flavors of Windows, various old browsers, we were trying to make it work so it would work throughout and it would stand some test of time, it would be easier for other people to pick up, nothing to install or load. Um, and uh, we knew that the applicant interface, we, need, we knew we needed an editor interface, and we knew it would be nice to have an administrator interface. The applicant interface is where we spent most of our time this year. We got it all done, but the most clean was the applicant interface, and that included them being able to upload documents in PDF format. So there'd be a check to see is it a PDF, and part of that goal was to eliminate any um, um, data including their name or the machine they're on or something else that would identify them. Um, the editor interface, part of what we did, um, involved uh, allowing those students to go ahead and just get online, see what students were or applicants were assigned to them for grading and where they could either look at an individual document by clicking on it or just go ahead and pull them off. I have 15 applicants to grade in this in one case. I have 15 personal statements, and in some cases the personal statement was optional. I'm going to pull it all down as a zip file and open it in my own way on my own computer in my own time. Maybe print them all off, go to Aruba, and do it slow style. <laughs> Um, our administrator interface, we knew we needed to show summer results, we knew we needed to overwrite data, but we really, even as meeting as a committee, we never really said this is what we wanted in the administrator interface. So at least this year, it was just for people, um, my supervisor and myself, to just have a way to get in there and change things a little safer rather than through a MySQL interface or through using Linux commands, just go ahead and through the browser, go ahead and student panic. They they marked that they had completed their application and it really wasn't done yet, something like that. And just kind of unmark it so they can finish the process themselves. Right. Bridge is going back, I think. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what, what I'm going to do now before Paul comes back with the very technical aspects of it, we're going to go through or run through or walk through through the applicant interface and through the editor interface so that you can see what a student would see and, and what decisions they would have to make. We want to picture it. <laughs> okay. So this is the first thing that they would have to do is access a secure URL and it would be um, the only way you can access it is you have to use your Duke Net ID. And um, this is something Paul will explain, you know, it's a secure you know, um, ID that every student would have. So this is a, once you access that URL, this is the page that you would particularly see that would already be pre-filled with your name, your net ID, your, um, your email. Um, and then at the bottom, you'll see that there will be an honor pledge that each student would have to take in terms of the selection process. They put their initials down at the bottom, and then they would go ahead and click on start to begin the process. So then what it does is it's going to be, go ahead, it's going to pre-fill some of the uh, case note competition applications. It's going to let them know you have started. And it's going to go ahead and assign for them um, the ID, their student ID that they would be using so that, as Paul was saying, they would remain anonymous. Um, on each one of these, it allow them to view their contact or update their contact information. They'll be able to uh, enter their journal preferences, upload the required documents, and then at the end, of course, finalize the application. And final means just that it is final. They would be able to make any other changes. And then also, they would be able to review all of their saved information. So this is the first button here, which is the view the contact information. So they can go ahead and view that. If they wanted to, they can enter a second email address for contact. They can also enter uh, a phone number um, as well. And then from here, they can go ahead and just click continue. Just trying to make it as user friendly as possible. Then on the journal preferences, as Paul was stating, even though you can enter, the student will be able to enter what their uh, journal preferences are, for these exclusive, for the exclusive journals, you're only going to be selected for one. So you definitely want to put your top choices in rank number one. Um, and then under the non-exclusive, you can choose all three of these. You don't have to choose any of these, or you can choose all three of these. Now, so that, so that means that a student has the potential to have one exclusive and one or more non-exclusive, or they can only choose the exclusive ones. And then, of course, they would, they wanted to, they could save their changes, and then we can continue on um, through this process. Now, what this does is, uh, this is their, uh, it shows you what your journal preferences would be. So, this particular person wanted to do the Alaska Law Review as their number one, then you see the Duke Journal of Comparative International Law, so on and so forth. And then for this particular person, he, he wanted to have two options for the non exclusive journals. So the, save your changes and you move on to the next screen. And then on this particular screen is where you actually um, upload all of the required documents. The case note in the PDF form was going to be required. Um, the personal statement is going to be per journal, whether they wanted a personal, personal statement or not. But you absolutely, in order to continue through this process, you have to submit your case note. Um, personal rec personal statements are recommended, but that was not going to be a requirement. So, as you can see, just very easy, browse, upload, um, just kind of make it very streamlined and very easy for the students to be able to um, roll through this process. The next screen that they would see is to be able to upload their personal statement for their non-exclusive journals. And it's going to operate in the very same way. It has to be in a PDF form. Um, and then they submit it if, you know, if they choose to on the personal statements, and then they would continue. And then on this particular screen, it's basically just kind of a confirmation. Your case note has been successfully updated. Um, I mean, excuse me, not updated, it has been uploaded. And then it gives them, they still at this point have, um, you know, they can change. They can um, delete the existing file. They can upload another one. So they still have the option of making some changes at this particular point. They can do that for the case note, and they can also make changes for the personal statement at this point if they'd like to. And then the next screen that they're going to get to is now it's time to finalize and actually submit their application. So it's pretty much going to review for them. It's going to tell them that their contact information section is complete, journal preferences is, is complete, and their case note file has been uploaded. So it's giving them that reassurance that what they entered is actually showing up. 
And then once you get down to the exclusive, it'll let them know if that personal statement has not been uploaded. And remember that is not a requirement, it's just recommended, but it'll let them know that they still can submit it if they choose to. And then on the second screen that they get to for the non-exclusive journals, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to let them know if their personal statement has not been uploaded and let them know that they can um, submit it if they'd like to. Um, and also, so when we get to this last screen at the bottom, they now have the option to finalize now um, and they can continue or go back to the main application page. Now, on the screen, before the actual final, well, actually, this is going to show if anything is incomplete. So this is just showing you what would happen if a case note was missing or if there was something that was not going to allow them to continue through this process. So that's the screen that they would see. Now, once they have finalized, it'll tell them that the, uh, the finalized has been completed. Um, at this point, they cannot make any other changes. They cannot submit any other information at this point. And that's going to be, then they can also review. So then they'll have the screen where they can kind of review all of their contact information, what they submitted. You know, they can keep this for their records, but it's just going to give them an idea of everything that they've done for submitting for the case note. So that is what is going to happen um, or what someone will see, what the applicant will see as they're going. Now we're going to look at the interface for the editor. So my name is Michael Wright, obviously not Michael, but Michael Wright. And I'm going to be, I've been selected to be an editor on the, D, the, e, the DELPF journal. So this, on this particular, it's going to list all the applicants that are assigned to me for grading. It's going to allow for me to actually switch a journal if I've been assigned to a, uh, more than one journal. I can check which editors have been submitted the scores. I can also list applicants assigned to another editor in that particular journal. And I can actually save all of, of the summary of the grades in a CSV chart. So that would be, if you just go back one sure. screen, the, so most editors, those that are editor in chief or case note uh, assigned for this particular, uh, so out of say 30 editors, two usually have the second journal administrator area and all the rest will literally just see the top. So the reason for the bottom is so that the editors themselves, they, their the journals are very independent. The editor-in-chief would contact those editors that are slow in turning in their documents. They can see but can't change their scores and they can also just look at what students still haven't, haven't applied yet. Are those permissions granted by role? That is correct. In, in Drupal or are you doing this against some uh, it is uh, literally in um, a mark in the database. My SQL database is programmed in my in PHP. Okay, so you create a role that's uh, you know a junior editor and a senior editor. And in this case, it's it's literally just an extra column in the journals in the journals table. And yes, like is it is administrator in okay. marking yes. <laughs> so yeah. you actually went into the SQL table itself and changed it. Uh, this is all set up via administrator interface, but we don't use Drupal at all here. Oh, okay. This is not for this particular project. I see. All right. At least, I mean, we, we do have plans um, to use some Drupal in the future. Oh, but, sorry. Uh, was... Yes. <laughs> but that's slightly different. It's still a very good question as far as the approach and, mm -hmm. and sort of how we do things. So it's it's all very table-based. Yeah. Uh, MySQL tables as far as uh, how we save and store the information. And we update those tables and through PHP right. language. Yeah, because we I mean, we have Drupal administration and we have we have you know administration of the you know, who can attach the SQL database and modify it. That's a whole other layer that's in the Linux system. And then we also have authentication against LDAP. And it's really getting a little dicey, especially when you have people whose usernames are the same two or more of those areas. Well, yes, that, it does sound like it could get quite complicated. And clearly, the Drupal's the framework that helps you to create the pages in the first place. Yeah. And, uh, and, and as such, you know, you may have to restructure some of that to allow for more different fields. Um, in this particular case, we tracked everybody by NetID. Everyone has a unique NetID. Yeah. Um, and the name just didn't matter. If two people had the exact same name, or if someone had just unusual data in their name, I'm thinking of uh, my friend Chris O'Toole, you know, got that little apostrophe, just in case something doesn't, 
you know, fail somewhere, one way or another, then that is very reliable. Thank you. Sure. So in continuing, I'm in my set this looking at the interface, I'm actually almost done, and then Paul is really going to get into the technical aspects of how he created all of this. Um, this is just showing you the screen um, that the editor would see if uh, he or she needed to uh, switch to another journal. Um, and then on this particular one is where uh, it's going to show uh, what has happened with their student. Uh, this particular person has 11 students that um, they are looking at. It shows their alias. It, they can look at their case note, what the score is. Um, if they uploaded their personal statement and what that statement score is and if they needed to make any changes they could and if you make the changes you just click on the update button button and then it would just um, allow your changes to be saved and then these are the stats for grading the case note it's going to show as of this, as of this particular time what is what has been happening with grading what have the editors um, done in terms of grading each of these case notes um, it gives a grade range, it gives a count in the, in the range, the percentage standard, and then what this, how this person has been grading. And basically what this is doing is allow, giving the editor something so that they could, what I call, you know, stay honest, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I'm just saying it just keeps them consistent, making sure that the grading is consistent and it's not skewed, so um, these stats are used for that. And that's it for both of the interfaces. And then Paul is going to now talk about um, the technology and resources. That's awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those are some good thoughts. I'm going to just back up one slide here. Um, this one thing I wanted to add to this is uh, one of the things that we have had troubles with in the past, at least I've heard, um, was the students, the graders themselves, would normalize their own data. And, um, and uh, you know, so here it's very clear this is the grading scale 1.5 to 4.3. Um, and this is the proportions that are expected that professors use when they're grading, um, at least with the classes of a significant size. So uh, if, you know, someone said it's just an easy grader, it doesn't seem very fair it's that this person got such and such students degrade, and this other person got such students degrade. Well, gee whiz, everyone with this editor A, uh, grader A, is all making it into the journal. And uh, again, the, the purpose for normalization is covered here as well. We don't enforce it here, but at least we could check it after the fact as well. Um, so the technology again, I, I had just started introducing this before. Uh, basically, again, it was Things that we have on hand, and not only that we have on hand that we're are either using for other projects. Um, we have a, an, a, a fundraising auction every year at the law school, and we basically use the same technology. We have several other projects, and a lot of it's pretty straightforward stuff that's available on the web already. So I need to send an email. I need to do MySQL interactions. I need to upload or download documents. That, Code samples are all over the place and open source to use using a PHP language. I got involved with PHP years ago, and part of the reason I got involved with it, it was for web interface type projects, and I come from a C C plus background from 25 years ago. So it, it just read really cleanly for me and it seemed easy to use. It's here to stay. Um, PHP's item <laughs> the fifth major revision and uh, and uh, one can either program very object oriented with it or very structured with it. Um, Linux, again, here to stay, it's um, uh, Linux and Unix have been around a long time, very known as being very stable, and Linux, again, is open source and free. Um, Apache seems to be pretty much the standard for uh, setting up the web servers and so forth, and we already had that on hand. Uh, we have uh, web services, I mean, we have system services at Duke Law as well as um, the general OIT group over at, at uh, Duke University, and there are several systems to choose from as well as I'll, I'll dabble with it myself. Using enough again to set up authentication, and, uh, and that was one of the goals here was to make it secure. And MySQL is one of the standards, again, uh, for SQL compliant 
again, easy enough to shift back and forth, but uh, we had it on hand. The, the way we uh, decided and Bridget started with this is we decided to use a shibboleth for our authentication. It's the Duke University standard now, and it's been the standard for Duke University a few years, and the law school was just getting rolling with it, and they had just gotten started with it uh, a few months before I started, and uh, certainly that we didn't want to drop what we had learned, so I just dug into the code that uh, previous we had previously hired out to Duke Services Group, and I just sort of picked up on that. <coughs> so uh, after Shibboleth authentication, that's where you pick up the net ID, and that, that can be stored. Uh, the tables here, it seems interesting that, uh, how to really make it clean enough for applicants. So the more the applicant can enter, the more trouble we get into. So what we really wanted was a, a table of all the potential students that could apply. And we wanted all of the existing second year and beyond that are, were probably editors. And from there, we, uh, we used that as a basis for collecting people's names and collecting people's email addresses and so forth, all based on that net ID. So we got a net ID, then we do check based on net ID, where do they sit in the student info table, or where do they sit in the editor info table. And that says whether they're allowed to apply to student, or when they come to the editor screen for the first time, as greater, what are they going to see? So we, we, this way we don't get any false applicants or people with false hopes that they want to apply. No one outside the law school um, has access, et cetera. Um, and so when a student actually starts an application, it'll be pulled from student info, and then we create a row in the applicants table. We create, once they start entering preferences, we create a row in the preferences table. Um, and again, it's laying out what they want. Um, and that same applicants table will hold, have they finalized? Have they uh, signed off on the honor code? Holds the honor code initials. Um, it holds dates and so forth. And uh, similarly, the editor's info, that gets pulled into the editor's table. And uh, once the shuffle is done, is a, is a formula to assign uh, on a particular journal, these editors are going to grade for these applicants. That's just hold and held in the assignments table. And, you know, the assignments table looks just like the scores table, except the scores table will, like, will start to exist and be populated as they start entering scores. So are those tables updated in real time as students are entering their information, or do you batch them? It's in real time. So uh, the, the MySQL interactions are, are one at a time. We only have 210 or so applicants, and uh, the system can certainly handle it. During our, our mandatory training for the applicants, we held that in two sessions, and we encouraged the students to start the application on the fly while they were in the meeting. Most of them brought their laptop computers, and we had 120 people at one time all using the system. So the, data, the database can certainly handle as well as the server. Um, the miscellaneous tables, well, late in the game, and it was a very, very good idea, uh, Wayne had mentioned that we should be logging everything. <laughs> so basically I decided to uh, create an events table, and whenever an applicant presses on a button, essentially we log it. Um, and similarly, when an editor goes ahead and does a grading, we, we log it. This way we can sort of see what's going on, and just occasionally we, we get checked on it. We have a lot of automated checks to see who's applied, when they applied, and so forth. But, you know, every once in a while, uh, I have not programmed for it, and we just get onto a MySQL interface and look and see, well, who is, which editor hasn't even downloaded the uh, the case notes yet that they're supposed to grade. Oh, they just did that yesterday. They've been doing it a week and a half. But the EIC mentioned something to them. Um, uh, whole GPA, uh, we don't really like to keep anything sensitive on the server when it, or the database if it doesn't need to be. So 
grades will be are just released once the um, all of the editors, once the graders have all handed in information, we'll have a uh, button to click on upload GPA. We'll throw it in a table, which is fairly secure as it is. Um, Calcu do our calculations and then just drop the table. So uh, basically, uh, that's used as some of the journals want to want to account for, say, thirty percent of of your overall score will be based on how well you're doing here in the law school and whether you can handle this uh, being on an exclusive journal. Um, and then the journals table, which, as we said, uh, some of the criteria for that journals table. Um, the complete name for the journal, as well as the short name, um, and the various things that are special about that journal, we try and hold it in that table. So security, um, uh, Duke University has its own server. So basically, uh, we set up uh, Apache properly so that it goes to a separate port and we get a secure connection. And it's fairly transparent to the user. As soon as when they try and go to that web address, they're redirected and they get a login screen. It's actually off, and then once they're authenticated, it'll come back. Um, as far as the student's concerned, it's magic and it, it works, but we, have, we now have a net ID as a session variable that we can hang on to and use within PHP. And uh, we can uh, try and figure out whether or not the main page, informational page, is about. Uh, the case note competition, the journals competition, whether any of that can be served by anyone outside the law school, whether you have to be a part of the law school to see it, etc., or do you actually have to be an applicant or an editor to actually see any of it. So that, that's uh, some of what we have to agree on. Uh, we have, a, as I mentioned, the web servers. We have servers local to the law school. And we have some servers that are Duke University virtual servers. We use the Duke University virtual server. Um, and that, in this case, check the form data and uh, checks all, checking up all uploaded documents. So um, we just want to see that a PDF is really a PDF, both for the student's sake and just to make sure we're not getting anything bad. Um, I wrote the majority of the code in PHP. One, I know it. Two, it translates well, and it's easy to view and review. Um, there are a lot of convenient examples available on the web for anything that I was having trouble with. Um, I used post for any of the submitted values. So basically, they didn't see it as they would as you get on top of the screen. It didn't become part of the URL. Um, there are MySQL functions, uh, and that's been improved a lot over the MySQL functions for database interaction. And again, that can be programmed object oriented or not. Um, I can check uploads. Downloads are easy all through PHP. Now, uh, as far as formatting goes, I didn't even bother with uh, CSS. We just formatted the tables through HTML tables for just the look and feel that uh, Bridget walked through. Make it clean, but it didn't have to be over the top, especially as far as time consuming. And the only system command that I needed to use, a uh, PHP system command to the Linux interface was for forming the zip files, but everything else was built in. Now, uh, I really, I'm used to working in places where we have a test, dedicated test team with te <laughs> that would write the test cases for me and create some test data, but I did it this year and I just tried to make sure we reviewed it well. Um, we, as we, my theory on something doing something totally on paper versus totally online is there's always going to be some mistakes this first year. And we run into little glitches, but Thankfully, nothing bad yet. Of course, students haven't been notified yet because this is still ongoing. So this is going to happen over the next few weeks, but um, the applicant interface and the editors getting the grade all work very well. Um, I, 
For creating the test data, I, I literally, I created some before the whole project began, but after the project began, and I could actually see how many students applied for what journals, I could then create really uh, realistic um, examples. So it wasn't an even spread. Um, Duke Law Journal, by far, almost everyone picked their number one for preference. And uh, LNCP was almost everyone picked for their number two preference. There are two oldest journals. And preference makes a, a big deal as far as when uh, going through to figure out these exclusive journals, there's a second pass after I determine score that people will on, who pick number one are going to be looked at for each of the journals until exhausted. Uh, we have uh, uh, so we had a similar test machine, so we could actually run it on a separate server, and that worked quite well. And uh, in this case, I decided to use the real editors because uh, that just made sense, and I added people like myself as one of the editors. I added myself as an applicant too, so I could have that view. We have uh, administrator view. Again, I didn't have Bridget go through it. I didn't put it up. We basically just didn't get around to really going through it with the committee and seeing what was there because what it ended up is just myself and my supervisor, the only ones who were going to use it. But we got it right. Uh, we, we can correct and override student application information. Uh, editor grading, we could see if there was any omissions, corrections. We can normalize their data if they don't normalize it. Hopefully we won't have to do that. And, uh, uh, and then produce both detailed and summary spreadsheets. In other words, uh, rank. Uh, say 1 to 40, if there's 40 openings, uh, who are the top 40 for Duke Law Journal? And uh, since we're, again, since the first year, we'll also do, every single score will be also printed um, into the spreadsheet. I use CSV format uh, just because it's super easy to spit out, and then if you just double click it, it'll open in the Microsoft Excel or whatever. So there's, there's no, uh, trouble between the geek factor and, and anyone trying to open it and use it. Uh, so what our program did was it just simply plugged in a formula for each of the nine journals. It was percentage of case notes plus percentage of personal statement, which might in some cases was zero, because we did some of them take a personal statement and percentage of their GPA, and then just show those top 10 or 20 or 40 applicants, depending on the journal. And uh, for the exclusive journals, we then, uh, after plugging in that formula, then again, we go through iteratively who are the people who pick that, that particular journal as their preference number one, if there's any leftovers who pick that journal as preference number two until the slots are filled. Questions? <laughs> Uh, I do have a couple comments. Um, basically, it's, it's open source code. Um, if you do have questions about it, you could use it for other projects if you need to. Um, I, we certainly intend on using some of the base for other projects here at the law school, and uh, it, it worked fairly well. So your code's available for download? It is. All I got to do is ask me for it. <laughs> I have some kind of very simple questions because I've just started using MySQL and PHP and I did like a little online registration form. Okay. And uh, the way I ended up doing it, because I thought it might be more secure, um, was that I did the HTML code. We, we, for about a year and a half now, our website is not in Drupal. Okay. So I picked a page, um, the page type. Okay. Um, because uh, it had the biggest room for a, a block of code okay. to inserted in it, right? So in the, in the body of the page, I plopped my HTML code. And then I called a PHP file that was run, running on a more you know, back closet kind of server. Sure. Um, that's, that's much more locked down than a web server would be. I get it. And I also stored the data in um, MySQL on that server. 
is, was there any reason for me to have done that, or would it have been just as well to keep it all on the side? Well, that's an interesting question, and I, I didn't understand it initially either. You know, I'm, like I said, I come from a programming background where I programmed in C++ for IBM, doing WebSphere and so forth. You really, it's not really clear what's what's visible to the user, and and literally, you can put that PHP code; they won't be able to see the code. But you can put it right in the HTML document. And you can put it right, well, you would still, um, so typically, um, one way of doing it is to, instead of having index.html, think of index.php. And index.php can have all HTML code, just uh, bracket off with the question PHP, where you want to put in your PHP. Right. Or literally, in that spot, the only line of PHP might, you might have is, say, require or include fly.inc.php. Right. Just say, this is the include file. Well, we were in Drupal as well. Mm -hmm. um, for those set of pages, I would do the include to like a separate, more secure file. Yeah. Um, okay. But you can actually put PHP right in. It's a, yeah. it's a filter uh -huh. for uh, page types that you right, can right. enable for you know, administrators only. Yeah. And uh, that would probably be the easiest way. It's I've true. That a couple times. Thank you. And uh, as well, when you're setting up the Apache in the web server, you can actually go to the directory level and say, I want this directory, for this directory, mm -hmm. I want .html to be treated also as PHP. Um, can you do that where in the JavaScript? It would be in the Apache, Apache the configuration. Apache Either there or in the HDX file. Thank you. Yes. So there's there's more than one way to go around that. Security is a whole other issue. I've got a whole talk on security. So it, it really just depends on whether or not you want your parents truly sensitive data, like social security numbers and so forth. You, you have to go through uh, quite a few more layers of making sure you're, you're clean. Right. Yeah, and we are collecting on those registration pages. Sometimes we're collecting FAR ID numbers, which even though they're actually in New Jersey, they are published. A lot, of okay. people, <laughs> a lot of people are uh, very sensitive about them and say, yeah, we know they're published, but not a lot of people know where to go find them. So they really wanted us to keep those, those bar ID numbers. I've read some articles about it, but we also have in our systems group, we're web services, and I'm sort of die line the systems group, but our systems group actually has a security officer, and uh, they sort of, and he also makes sure our web, our web programs and our data and our database are all secure. Just to have someone double checking. I don't want to be the only one looking at it. I'm the, the web office and the IT office and the help desk and the security office and the systems group. I can appreciate that. That's um, <laughs> what Well, you have a hard job. <laughs> uh, other questions, comments? I think we're running about right on time, aren't we? Ahead of time. I don't think that clock is right. I got 11.13. Oh, that clock is definitely not right. Because we're supposed to have an hour? We're supposed to have up to an hour. Up to an hour? Okay. We're good. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this, I'm always looking for ways to recycle. Like once I taught myself how to do this little, this little page, I'm looking around for where else can I use this. I do the same. We will. You mentioned LDAP. We, we use LDAP as well within the law school. Yeah. And I had to pick that up as well. I just looked for some sample code. <laughs> yeah. I did too. And um, I, well, the LDAP instructions that were on the Rutgers website were really arcane. Okay. Uh, and, and you really couldn't figure out what you were supposed to do. Uh, I read you, some of the same. <laughs> <laughs> so you had, to, you had to find the guy, right, and right. call him. And then he told you what you really needed to do. And, and so we, for our student directory pages, um, where they um, they have their, you know, it's like a mug book, right? Yeah, yeah we have one of those. We right. just, yeah, they just read And we, we didn't want the world to be able to see that. We wanted Same. to limit it to Rutgers students. And so that's when we first hooked into LDAP. That was our first time using it. But I'm still not clear on how it's working because I just did a bunch of stuff and I called a bunch of people and uh, they said, Tweak this, do that, and and lo and behold, it's working for the student page. But now I'd like to have it work for. I'd like to create another content type, and also have uh, yeah, and have you know like a what what the professor.
messages are calling their internet. They want me to create sure. the internet on the same server. And uh, I'm not clear on what function or module within Drupal I should use to apply the LDAP rules to a new content type. I don't know where that's done in Drupal. There's, there's a redirector module. Is that where you do it? Um. Personally, in that situation, I would go into a multi-site setup. Uh -huh. um, essentially, a multi-site is a two Drupal installations yeah. with one set of code. So you have two configuration files. Um, and you can Google for multi-site installation for Drupal, and there's all sorts of instructions on how to do that. Yeah. Um, but that gives you a basically a blank slate of Drupal site to, to play with. And in that case, you could you know, apply different LDAP rules with the LDAP uh, integration module, which right. we use as well. Um, that way you can then just start playing with you know, adding features, adding content, um, and then be able to lock it down with a different set of permissions, different set of rules, roles, and all that fun stuff. Right. Um, now, do you know, can I just use um, then what I do for uh, Drupal configuration uh, for LDAP, where you have the um, you have the service DN, uh, the, the role, the, the ID, blah blah blah. Can I just at my whim add to that list of stuff? Like if I wanted to limit it to just students or just students in school I mean, twenty three. Uh, doing like making a more specific DM. Yeah, yeah. Uh, technically, yes, um, but it depends. I believe largely on the, the user that does the lookup. The little username and password you have to put at the end. Yeah. Um, I uh, believe depending on how broad he's able to see uh, network users, yeah. um, it wouldn't matter. So if he's able to see everybody, he'll then authenticate everything. You know, he might authenticate everything. I haven't. Specifically played with that because uh, in our role it's sort of ambiguous whether you know a students able to get on the website or a professor is so. Yeah, I just didn't know how much like when you call and have your service DM set up because mm -hmm. um, central people manage that doesn't give any control over it. Whether um, that's limited. That should be able to target specifically <laughs> that that DM. Though. But then I would have to call them and have me and make me a different service DM. Uh, no, actually, you would add to it. I can um, add to it as uh, long as a, I use the legal. Yeah, as long as you use a correct DM. Um, yeah, those definitions. Scheme, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, I've been afraid to um, experiment on this server because a I don't have a template, right? so this is the production. Website. I don't have one. Either. Right, production website for the law school. Hired an outside firm to come in and design it and install it. So we set up the system with patches and you know, all the stuff. We loaded Drupal, but then they did all the style sheets and you know, various PHP code, creating a bunch of content types for us. And so now I'm in the mode of like reverse engineering everything they did so I can figure out how it all works. So it's the double edged sword of things and deals. To do it. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, if you want to uh, like email me or with any of your questions, I'm not like, by any means like a Drupal guru or anything. Wait, but, did you bring business cards with you? Um, I don't think I have business cards, but um, I have a contact. But I can give you my. So do I. They're 10 years out of date anyway. Mine too. Um, it's N D R G. At F C S L. I, I'm the webmaster there, and uh, we uh, not too long ago I was the, I was a Computer technician, um, I took over the web role, and we were moving to Drupal, um, basically at my behest because we didn't have a content management system. Right, neither did we. And so we had to convert all that over, and yeah, I was spending all my time creating 
creating web pages for people. Yeah, it, it's a, it was a long odyssey, and um, I learned a lot. Yeah. You learn trial by fire teaches you the most. Yeah, that's true. Well, our, our dean at the time um, had a meeting with me, and he said, well, if I spend the $35,000 that this firm wants to design our website with a content management system, that means that we don't need a webmaster anymore, right? I said, no. 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 It doesn't mean that unless you want to call these guys every time. And pay them to right. comment. But the, um, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, the, uh, the communications person was in his office every day saying, no, no, once I have this content management, well, there's not a day that goes by that she doesn't call me. You know? I mean, I'm, I'm largely in a holding pattern, but I still have to create pages. I still have to go in, at least make them stubs so that people can go and fill out information. Mm -hmm. Because you give people the, the keys to the kingdom to be able to create whatever content on your web page, yeah. and it gets out of control fast. Yeah. You know, that was another thing that, um, I think the vendor sort of led the dean down the garden path. The vendor led Dean to believe that we could have very specific levels of granularity as to what people could do and not do. But I've gone in there and created the roles, and I found like, okay, if I want the development people to be able to create a new page uh, and a new menu item, and I do want them to be able to do that because I'm not sure, I have to give them a lot more permission than I really want. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and I'd like to be able to say on, you know, in this level of the menu hierarchy. Mm -hmm. This is where they can have those privileges. No, I have to give them those privileges yeah. for the whole site. And, and what I ended up uh, doing was um, we actually created a web committee mm -hmm. um, based on that sort of problem that there's no, it's an all or nothing yeah. scenario in that case. So we have editors mm -hmm. and then the department heads get carte blanche access to their content, mm -hmm. but I still hold the keys to creating new pages and creating menu items. Um, you know, it's a it's an imperfect system, yeah. but at the same time, you know, it keeps me in a job. And, uh, right, and if they can afford to dedicate a person largely to doing that, that's great. We see we don't have a dedicated yeah. person for that. And I have to say, the communications person does as much as she can. Mm -hmm. um, and we found through experience, I mean, we must have had like 13 to 14 people that we trained to be able to do their own pages. And in reality, there's probably about three who actually use their accounts, okay. you know. Okay. And so the communications person spends a lot of her time um, putting in data and creating pages for those other departments. But she doesn't have to produce a new book anymore. She, there's a lot of those. We decided we're not doing that anymore because it kills trees and it's so shamelessly self-promoting. I mean, I got the other day I got a um, a law school. I forgot which law school it was, but they I got this beautifully done document in a one of those semi-transparent parchment-like envelopes that was basically bragging that their students had won some moot court competition. Okay, and then there was another one, similarly bragging about some faculty achievement. And then there was a poster, which on one side listed all of their faculty, and on the other side was the tree. Was that you guys? Um, I don't know about that. You know, and it's sent in a, a tube mailer. Oh, yeah. And I'm saying, man, their communications department must have a hell of a budget. Yeah. But they can do all this, and What's the point? Is it so that when it comes time to vote for the, the rankings, the people will remember their name? It's, uh, a, it's a weird game that marketing plays. I, I, I never understood marketing myself. Um, every time they start talking, I stop understanding. Yeah. But um, one of those probably was us. Um, that's just the way our marketing department works. but. Yeah, we're two to separate services, yeah. so marketing does what marketing does, and it yeah. has very little bearing on how we operate in IT. Yeah. Um, oh, well. 
I, I mean, I learned a lot about Drupal. Um, I went from knowing, okay, I know how Drupal works, I know how to get installed, to you know having to install like a dozen different modules and configure them all correctly, and uh, start uh, playing around with views and stuff like that to get the things I want out of Drupal. Um, and largely, it's served me well. Um, it's saved my butt more times than I can than I can say, but. Uh, it's been a learning experience. A lot of times you have to say no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had one situation where um, the, the CLE group, um, they wanted me to create a bunch of pages for them, which I did. And they wanted, um, they wanted the courses for each month. There were maybe like three or four for each month. And they wanted them each to have a page. Um, and I said, well, okay, we can do that. You know, we can create a page for each month, or I can make one big page and you know, put a page division in. They said, oh, make one big page, because they're the ones who are going to have to, uh, once I put the initial one up, they're the ones who are going to have to update it and support it. This is that make it all one big page, and that's the best for us. I said, okay, so we did that, and then over in this you know, right-hand column, I put January, February, to the page divisions for each month. Well, then they said, okay, that's great, but we want to keep the data for classes that already happened, because we have bragging rights to those. So we want people to be able to see the kinds of things we offered in the past. We don't want to delete them. I said, fine, you don't have to. They said, but every time people invoke this page, it goes to the very, wow. very first month. I said, okay, I can have that link go to a bookmark that I put down in the current month. And it just means that once a month you'll have to move where that bookmark is. Are you up for that? They said fine. So I did it. But what Drupal does, if you do that, if you send somebody to a bookmark, you lose the menus on the left hand side of the page. If you just go to the beginning of the page. Oh, so it's automatically been scrolled past the menu. Sort visibly. of, sort of. And I, that's what I thought was going on. So I scrolled all the way to the top, and the menu still did not appear. Now, isn't that an interesting glitch? That would probably be something with your team. Um, I mean, we use uh, like uh, the anchors all the time, the, the hashtag anchors. Yeah, yeah. Um, all the time. Uh, I haven't had any particular issues with my menu disappearing. Huh. Um, it would, I guess I would have to see it to understand it. But, um, it it's called an anchor because yeah. you give something in the right, page right. ID and it jumps. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I did it a little bit differently because a lot of times I, rather than use the, the Drupal busy way, mm -hmm. I just put in full HTML mode mm -hmm. and go into it. Yeah, well, a lot of times like, that's the best way to do it. Yeah, because some of that code comes out really funky if you just let Drupal do it. And it, it rearranges it when you know when you well, close the page, yeah. it does its own crazy formatting. I, I get a lot of people who copy from Word and paste into the box and does it work. It up. <laughs> and, you know, there, yeah. there's even a special paste from Word button on the WYSIWYG editor that we have. And it's oh, like really? People just go, oh, I'm paste, and you know, it looks okay in there, and they hit save, and it's like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, the preview doesn't always give you a true preview on things. But um, yeah, there's a there's a bunch of new changes coming for Google Seven, which will make it a lot easier to manage. Well, you know, we're on five, and um, I said to the uh, at the time, I said to the developer, you know, six is here. It's been here for a while. He said, no reason to go to six unless they, it has some specific, you know, uh, feature that you have to have. And you're better off to stay with five. I thought, you know, okay, he was probably building in a little future job for himself when we go back and tell him that he needed to go to Drupal 7. Yeah, I've been playing with the alphas of Drupal 7, uh, just, you know, seeing what's new, what's changed. Yeah. Uh, and the whole administration interface has been overhauled completely, so it's much more user friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives you a lot more, there are more options for one. And they organize it in just much better manner. Right? So you don't have that goofy navigator anymore? Or is that still 
Um, they don't, depending on what module you have, if you have administration menu, that black bar at the top. Okay, I have a module called administration menu that gives you sort of like a pull down menu of different common administrative areas to go to. And you say, I'm going to come in, build, blocks, and then configure from there. I can just go admin blocks. Um, but they've added that sort of feature to Drupal 7 where they've got like all your common areas to go to. You click on one, brings up a nice window that has all the finer controls in there. And then you even have a bar under that where you can put shortcuts to items that you use a lot. Yeah. So it's been improved quite a lot. Great. That's good. Well, <laughs> Uh, is it lunch now or? Said, you know, yeah, you I'll need, probably definitely give you a call. I, I need like to know other people who are doing Drupal. So that... um, Elmer Masters does a lot of Drupal. Oh, does uh, he really? He's a guy I actually look up to um, as far as um, knowledge in Drupal. Mm -hmm. um, he actually runs the Cali website on Amazon's uh, EC2 system, uh -huh. which is like a cloud hosting solution. Uh -huh. Where you can spawn like 100 servers if you need them. Wow. So uh, he's got that set up, and you know, I'm constantly doing it. Wow. Well, then you must not be very expensive. Oh, no, I mean, you pay for an hour of CPU time that you use, so you pay like 15 cents for an hour or so of CPU time. So. Yep.